what, what the lady's is talking about. Yeah. What's up, family? Question. Do you believe in miracles? Well, I got one for you. Trenton McKinley has been dead more often than most 13-year-olds. The Mobile, Alabama teenager was first dead for about 15 minutes after he suffered seven skull fractures when a friend's doom buggy trailer flipped over. He said, I hit the concrete and the trailer landed on top of my head. After that, I don't remember anything. Doctors told his parents that even if McKinley woke up, he would never be normal again. His mother said, they told me the oxidation problems would be so bad to his brain that he would be a vegetable even if he made it. The parents signed paperwork to donate their son's organs to five children in Birmingham who needed them. But a day before doctors were going to remove McKinley from life support, he started registering signs of cognition. The next day, he was scheduled to have his final brain wave test to call his time of death, but his vitals spiked, so they canceled the test. Wow, this guy went from no brain waves to now walking and talking and reading and doing math. Even with all of that good news, McKinley still isn't out of the woods. He's still in a lot of pain, he has seizures, and during one of the three brain surgeries he has already undergone, he's died four times. And about half of his skull is frozen in the hospital waiting for one final surgery to reconnect it. McKinley told WALA-TV that while he was unconscious, he believes he was in heaven. I was in an open field walking straight, he said. There's no other explanation but God. I can relate to that. And I'm sure if you live long enough, you've probably been in that situation a time or two yourself where you have a loved one on life support and you're trying to figure out what to do. Do you hope against all hope that the person comes through or do you make the call to terminate their life? Do you pull the plug? A friend of mine, mother was on life support and it had reached that point to where the doctor comes into the room and asks the family, what do you want to do? He told the children, there's nothing else that we can do. We've done everything we can do right now. There is no hope. They were split. It was eight of them and they were split right down the middle as to what to do. And it was very, very contentious, very emotional, each side equally passionate. Maybe about 24 hours later or so, she came out of the coma. Now, here's the trip part. Because of their arguing and the fact that they could not come to a collective decision, it bought her time. She came through and she lived for another year. They had their mother for a whole extra year. And it, it afforded them the chance to have those conversations that that they probably would not have had. It also, it just gave them more time to do things with their mother. She also, she got a chance to attend my homeboy's wedding and she got to do a couple other things that were milestones in her children's life and her grandchildren's life. But that was a very, very special year. And had they jumped and made the decision to, um, to terminate our life, they wouldn't have had those memories. Now, I will say this. 
she was in pain. I don't know if it was more pain than she had previously experienced, but I do know that she was very weak the entire time, but she was a soldier. She was, hey, wasn't even five feet tall, but man, she was a soldier. And she cooked that food for the wedding and everything, man. She wanted to have that honor. And even while ill, she was like, I, I got to be there. I'm, 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 I'm cooking. I'm going to do the cooking. Beautiful thing, man. And like McKinley said, when you try to figure out the reasoning behind this, and you try to think, man, you know, like, how could something like this happen? There is no explanation but God. No more talk. What the haters talking about?